Most people have probably seen a lot of the reporting and images and photos and videos. It, you know, it's a kind of devastation that is not frequently seen. I don't see anybody who says that, oh, this is a one-off thing, it will never happen again. So this is very clear proof of how investing in the social and economic justice actually has very high returns in the long run. This is Climate Conversations, a podcast by ClimateX, the online community building a movement to solve our climate crisis. So today we have a really, really important topic to address, uh, which is how do societies respond to catastrophic climate change related events? And I'm with my colleague, Dave Damlor. Glad to be here. And we have in our studio, Ramon Bueno, MIT graduate, independent consultant, climate modeler, and also someone who was brought up in Puerto Rico and will be telling us a lot about what's happening in the island these days. Welcome, Ramon. Glad you. you're here. Glad to be here as well. So, Ramon, before we get to the aftermath of Maria, tell us how you got to Puerto Rico in the first place, because there's an interesting story there, too. Right. Well, I arrived in uh, San Juan in January of 1963 from Miami, where I had moved in December of 61 when I left Cuba. <laughs> so it was a, uh, a, a two-phase uh, move. It was after the Bay of Pigs, uh, confrontation with the U.S. was escalating out of you know, every month, and the missile crisis was the next year while I was in Miami. So it's uh, that ex- extremely high-pitched Cold War era but then arrived in, in Puerto Rico in January of 63, and I, and I was there until, until I graduated high school and came to MIT. And you then, lived in San Juan, I believe, right? Yeah, in the San Juan metropolitan area, uh-huh. different neighborhoods. But, uh, and so now we're going to jump very quickly 55 years later and ask you what is happening in Puerto Rico today? What has been the impact of Hurricane Maria on an island which was already, I think, in a lot of financial and other troubles? Yeah, I mean, where, where to even begin? Most people have probably seen a lot of the reporting and images and photos and videos. It, you know, it's a kind of devastation that is uh, not frequently seen, uh, except sometimes in smaller islands where it's, a storm can go through and just devastate everything. Puerto Rico is bigger. It's not as big as Cuba, Dominican Republic, but it's a bigger island and more, much more developed economy. So to see the storm go through and basically collapse the entire functioning of the economy, especially through the power system, but not just the power system, the water systems, the roads, bridges, you know, it's almost like a post-war situation. Then the added context is that, you know, Puerto Rico was in extremely dire economic financial terms uh, prior to this. And that's a whole other story, you know, many reasons and all that, but that's a whole other uh, story. So, but you have a situation where you're in an extremely difficult financial situation, and all of a sudden you get total devastation of your economy. So you don't have to see too much more, but then you see all the photos, the stories. I, I haven't been since the storms. I We were talking before. I mean, I had the ironic coincidence of being in San Juan in, in late July, invited by the Center for Investigative Journalism, a local research group there of journalistics. And the topic was impacts of climate change in the island and in the Caribbean. So it was very you know, painful knowing a few weeks later, literally a couple of months later, that for a while I couldn't even reach the people that were colleagues that were there to see how they were doing. I mean, eventually I started connecting, and, and fortunately most of the people were fine. But there had been other journalists there from, uh, from around the Caribbean, and I re- remember eventually talking to someone from the British Virgin Islands. And I, how are you? So I'm fine, but I'm glad we went to a shelter because our place was blown away and, you know, uh, that sort of thing. So that now is repeated throughout the island. And so imagine a lot of people, half, let's, let's say half the population, no refrigeration, no lights, no electricity. Never mind if you have health problems and medications and all that kind of stuff, just dealing with food, you know. You can't buy food it's, if it's going to go bad. I mean, you can only buy what you're going to consume. Temperatures, you know, mid to high 80s, 90s, high humidity. Not only do you have, you know, maintaining your health, physical, but also even mental health. So it, it touches across the entire, uh, what does it mean to be, you know, in a community or being, you know, livelihood. Just name the aspect of it and, and it's being impacted tremendously. You know, one of the things that hit me the most the first week or so 
seeing a photograph, and when I read the caption, it was from a neighborhood near one of the neighborhoods that I lived in, and it was taken from a second floor balcony. Uh, this is a, a neighborhood built in the 60s, and it looks like a river, literally a river, with the porches, the water at two-thirds up the doors. And this is a neighborhood that I used to bicycle through and all that. So this is not like a slum that happened to be in a river. You know, this is just, so it brought it home very, very close to me. But there are, in the city, for example, and my sister lives in Guaynabo. It's a solidly built neighborhood, middle-class neighborhood. That, there were damages there, you know, trees fall down, power lines, this and that, there's damage. But most of the homes, or many of them, solidly built concrete, whatever they survive, you know, some damage here, maybe a window or door. There are other places, smaller towns, and this is all over the island, whether it's in the northeast, south, where uh, a higher percentage of people are poorer, the, the construction is, you know, flimsier, zinc roofs, uh, wood, this and that. Those things cannot withstand 150 mile an hour winds for hours and hours on end. So. You know, there, there have been gripping photographs where you see someone sitting with a couple of chairs on the floor of their house because there's nothing else left and saying it was calming to be there because that's the only thing that's left. What can we even do? Like, this is system-wide failure. Right. Everything essentially stopped working. So how do you restart the engine? Extremely challenging question. On the one hand... You need power, right? I mean, Puerto Rico is highly electrified. That's one thing. In the second part of the 20th century, there was a lot of industrialization and agriculture was de-emphasized. So a lot of things that are electrified. So electricity is the lifeblood of, of the economy. So it has to get restored. So that's why there's a lot of emphasis on restoring the power system, the power lines and all that. Second part of that, which is something I'm sure we'll talk about, is that there's a growing consensus in the island that just doing that, restoring the power system so that it functions, is just not only not good enough, it's, a, it's just laying the ground for another disaster. Asking for double for future storms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The power system, the power utility has been, is broke as well. It went to bankruptcy in July. It's got well over a decade of just, never mind whether it's mismanagement or all that, but insufficient investment maintenance has been very low. A year ago, the, the, the was without storms, the mm -hmm. power went out for days and days mm -hmm. and days in the mm -hmm. entire island, and then in some parts for much longer. So you have to bring that back somehow. But people have had to rely on all kinds of things, not just what the government can provide, but there's a lot of community efforts, people helping each other out. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It's it's in times like these that the strength of bonds in the neighborhoods and the communities and the towns uh, counts. Uh, it's also when failures in governance and, and, and malfeasance and all that stuff count even more. Everything's exaggerated. And so there's a lot, yeah. you know, everybody, everything is exposed. It's like an X-ray shining through the entire, and it, it's, it's not better or worse necessarily than any other place, but when you're exposed to in full, everything is there to be seen. So, so. do you think that community-driven energy supply could become a reality? Not only do I think it, it, it's going to become a reality, I think it's, it's, it's a necessity. And I think in the, a lot of the discussions that I've been part of and witnessing, it's, it's, it's amazing the transformation that I've seen. You know, there have been people talking about the need to get off. You know, Puerto Rico, like, like most of the Caribbean, relies on f fossil fuel, almost all of it imported, expensive, out of your control. That's money flowing out of, of your economy. So there's been a long, long time discussion that you know that has to go. You know, it's how do you do it? You know, how, over how long a period? But now there's a, a realization that the inability to bring it all back quickly enough. Some people have, have been analyzing, saying there are going to be remote areas that it could be half a year. So there's a lot of targeting of efforts and thinking about we got to bring in their systems that can help the community start consolidating some core essential power services. And if that happens at a broad enough scale, I mean, at some point you have to worry about as the system comes back to life, how it all integrates. But it's been remarkable to me to see how at many different levels, experts, people on the street, reporting, you see, all of a sudden everybody's talking about 
Of course, you can't have a brittle, centralized aging system based on fossil fuels. You have to move to some form of decentralized network, smartly organized of microgrids that, you know, if, if an arm is broken or cut off, it doesn't mean the whole thing comes out. It just means that stops working until it's made to work again and that sort of thing. And that's, it's, it's, it's a remarkable, I think the consensus is pretty much gel that that's what you need to do. Some people start saying, well, no, the centralized system needs to be functioning. And of course, you know, you, it, it has to function in the short term, but what everybody's saying is, don't put more into that that's, than is essential. And fortunately, there's an effort in Congress to uh, change the, the, the law. Apparently, says that a lot of this FEMA assistance can only go to restore what was there. And a lot of people are basically saying, that's crazy. That's, mm. Not only is it wasting money, it's setting up the grounds for the things, the same thing to happen all over again. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping there'll be some success with that so that some of that money starts going into smart future uh, It sounds investment. like a, a decentralized, more decentralized system that's flexible to the whatever is happening in a particular location. Yeah, yeah. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And actually, one one thing that I think it's important to highlight here, which is what the reality of Puerto Rico and the Caribbean, uh, you know, a lot of things are expensive, okay? And a lot of times people say, well, you know, integrating all this new technology, that's expensive. And, and it can be true. But the thing is, what's expensive, it's all compared to what? Electricity costs in Puerto Rico are at least twice the average in the US and several times what the low cost uh, states. So something, a solution that in an efficient energy system state in the US might be costly because you have such cheaper power in a situation like that, but especially in a situation where the system is collapsed and it's likely to keep collapsing. Mm -hmm. It's actually a pretty good investment, Long I would term. say. Yeah, so it's all in how you value things. So, sure. you know, what is the value of things when, when you're facing catastrophes, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is a hypothetical question, but given the kind of political authority we have in Washington, D.C. these days, how receptive might they be to F FEMA assistance going in decentralized community energies? I think there's a chance in the sense that Aside from all the political and ideological things, there's a growing discussion in places like FEMA and all that. It, it had been happening, for example, with flooding and all that. There's a growing consensus of it doesn't make any sense to repeatedly build somebody's house that refuses to prepare it for higher sea levels and all that kind of stuff. At some point, people say enough is enough. It's just a wasted taxpayer money. So I, you know, I can't predict what's going to happen, but I think there's a receptivity in Congress and I think across party lines that, wow, this is expensive stuff. These crises are expensive. To the degree that they're not just a one-off chance that it's never going to happen again, we got to be wise with the money. So I'd like to bring it back to the local level a little bit. I know from our prior conversations that the last couple of months you've been very heavily into conversation and dialogue with uh, other Puerto Ricans. Uh, students and others in the Boston area. Could you tell us a little bit about what's been going on in those conversations? It's It's been really rewarding and satisfying to see, you know, the, the worst thing in a situation like that is feeling powerless reading the news. Uh, you can't so, actually be there. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. not being there. I mean, uh, yes, you can donate money on something or other, but you feel like, you know, is that is that enough? So I, I reached out and got in touch with the Puerto Rican Students Association at MIT, who were getting very organized and, and we've created some nice relationship there. You know, in terms of discussions, trying to, you know, what, what helps, what doesn't help, they've got a lot going on. They're also coordinating with similar efforts at Harvard and, and the two brought in people from other institutions around here. So that's been uh, very nice. At the same time, through them, I learned and got connected with a network of MIT alumni professionals, some of them have been working for a long time, others, you know, re more recent graduates, who have formed sort of an electronic group, f focus a lot on where do we go from here, and especially on the energy front. And that's, that's one of the areas where I was surprised also how quickly the consensus developed into, of course, I mean, there can be differences of, of shades of this and that, but of course we need to have a a, a completely different kind of power system. It's not smart microgrid. Yeah, you yeah, were talking about. Yeah, yeah. Networks, microsystems that are flexible and use you know smart technology. Uh, uh, so that that's been very rewarding. 
especially because on, at, in Puerto Rico there are a lot of MIT graduates uh, who have done very well, who are, you know, have relations with people at different levels of government and industry and all that. For example, there's a foundation for Puerto Rico founded by alums from, from MIT who have had some collaboration in some projects, and they're functioning right now. They've put aside their plans for development in the island, which they were doing quite well at, and just focusing on coordinating efforts. And they have, you know, there are people from the different levels of government and outside of government who've been participating in some of these discussions, developing sort of the, the framework and ideas of what is the direction that should be going. I also felt the need, having had personal contact in the past with Spanish-speaking parts of the administration, including President Rafael Reif and uh, Israel Ruiz, the vice president and treasurer, I reached out to them. My, my goal was to convey, A, the urgency of the situation in light of the economic crisis, and I was focusing on the scientific and academic community because I've had over the past decade, a good relationship uh, with many scientists who have built what's called the Puerto Rico Climate Change Council, it's sort of model on the intergovernmental panel on climate change, the working groups and periodically produce reports on the state of things. Sort of for an the IPPC? Island. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, for and, Puerto Rico. Yeah, so I've been having a growing relationship with these folks. And I know the value of the work that they do. And I, and I also worried about what's going to happen to these efforts. It takes a long time to build an organization, like a, a network of collaborators like that, in addition to the university taking a hit for hundreds of millions of dollars prior to this, just from the economic The University crisis, of Puerto Rico. University of Puerto Rico. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you, if you have to take a hit for hundreds of millions of dollars, it's, it's, it's serious stuff. But then there was physical damage from the storms and, you know, the island cannot afford to lose that as individuals and also collectively. So is that a real danger that people with connections or with expertise will just leave the island? It's always, a, you know, I mean, there's, there's, for the last decade, there's been a growing exodus from Puerto Rico. And unlike the exodus that happened in the middle of the 20th century, which tended to be poorer people who were being displaced as, uh, as the agriculture was displaced and, and industrialization came in, over the last decade or so, it's been a lot of professionals because if there are not enough opportunities and there are jobs in the mainland, you know, right now that's accelerating tremendously over the last two months. And Puerto Rico has a tremendous depth in professionals, highly trained, you know, academics, uh, PhDs, all kinds. But experts in energy and climate, resilient development, sustainability, I mean, the island cannot afford really to lose that right now. This is, this is the expertise that has to be brought to bear on the financial and uh, governmental decision making. If, if they're not part of that discussion, then who's going to make that discussion? Who's going to contribute? And th that's not where you want to go. So the hurricane exaggerated trends that were already underway. Absolutely. What you were Absolutely. Saying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and this, you can see that in the, in the discussions about how much you know, cronyism or not, and how are decisions make, being made, things that can be you know, sizable in terms of you know, amounts of money that we're talking about. So again, having people who are really knowledgeable about the topics at hand to be, is one of the most effective ways, aside from journalism as well, to have transparency and accountability into what's going on. Otherwise, you know, you, otherwise it becomes the same thing. You're reinforcing the very things that possibly brought you to the state of, uh, of, of being. So. so let me ask the counterfactual then. How do you prevent that from happening? So what steps concretely can are being done and perhaps institutions like MIT can help? That, that I mean, that's a hugely important question and there probably isn't one answer, but my response was to talk to as many people as would be willing to listen and highlight the importance of, you know, there, there are many spheres of activity that need attention, but, you know, I'm familiar with the academics, science, research. These are all very relevant things to what's happened and to what's going to need to happen. So I, I've been advocating that institutions, you know, MIT is what I know best, but this, is, this has been, this is going on at Georgia Tech, at Arizona State, and, you know, Georgetown, whatever. I, wherever there are enough people that are concerned that this kind of discussion is going on. Collaborations, uh, not just dropping some money in a bucket, but, you know, institutional collaborations that can help these uh, colleagues, these peers, continue doing their critical work 
but also in being able to tap into and, and nourish and continue enhance their work, this is the perfect time for that to consolidate, to grow. Even if there are many small collaborations, that can be, that can be the difference in, in certain efforts, certain groups to be able to keep functioning and contributing as opposed to just saying, I give up. So um, if, I, if I'm a listener, how do I plug into that network of folks trying to figure out a better way to do things? Great question. You know, there's always the many campaigns for, for collecting donations. But I would say if you have uh, ways of staying abreast of what develops in this post-immediate phase, which is collaborations that develop, all these things are going to require support. So if you happen to be someone who has plenty of support to provide or who knows people who will be very willing to be generous with that kind of thing, that's, that's one way to do it. Because those, those institutional collaborations have legs, right? They, they really help now, but they also help later and even later. And especially if they contribute to enriching the discussion about the steps that are about to be taken, right? Because that has longer roots. If that's done with collaboration and dialogue and respectful you know, sharing of opinions and all that with the local talent. I mean, nobody knows better the conditions in the Puerto Rican economy, society, than the people who've been living there and thinking about these things and, and working this, these topics their whole life. So it, it's not about having outside institutions who know a lot come in and parachute in saying, guess what, I have We're the solution. You. We have the solutions. No, no, it's about coming down and saying, let's collaborate, let's work together. What do you have in mind? Here's what we can bring to bear, mm -hmm. whether it's resources, but also just opportunities for collaboration and knowledge, too. I mean, not everybody has the same level of knowledge about any given topic. So I think the opportunities are enormous. And one of the things that's exciting is that I think also there's a realization by many people, and I certainly share it, and I've written about it, that one of the most valuable ways to have this experience be more than just recovering and getting over a, a horrible situation is to come out at the other end with not just a better Puerto Rico, a better economy, a better energy system, but a, a hub of learning and center of, for the Caribbean or other islands to benefit for people who want to, you know, figure out how to build capacity and resilience and, you know, so it could be a kind of growth industry for Puerto Rico. I, I, I think so. Showing I mean, the it, way for the rest of the It would the be a Caribbean. way to, yeah, I mean, there have been discussions about what kind of tourism to encourage in Puerto Rico. You know, it has some of the traditional, but there have been people, including this Foundation for Puerto Rico, who've been for the last few years saying, we need to bring not just people who want to sit at the beach and tan, but take advantage of nature, culture, all kinds of things that are going on. This would add yet another level, which is collaboration, study, research, uh, Conventions, share I mean, best practices, just sharing exactly, yeah. exactly, mm -hmm. um, and I think that's that would be a, a real lasting contribution to to the Caribbean and, and other places. I mean, other parts of the world are exposed to the same mm -hmm. kind of phenomena. Mm -hmm. you know? So let me reframe sort of the challenge versus the opportunity issue a little bit. In one way, is the fact that the system collapsed allows you to perhaps not just imagine an entirely new system, but even get some political and economic leverage to put that in place. So is that kind of bold imagination happening, and who's doing it, and how? It is happening. Who's doing it, and how much, and you know, it varies. But that's the reason that, which ties back to what I was just saying, that's the reason to make sure that all the people who have something valuable to say about this stuff in the island get to stay there, number one, be to say it and to, to be heard and to participate. But when you have a crisis like this, what is affordable, you know, changes, right? I mean, if you, if, if in, in your daily life with small disruptions, spending X amount of money on something might feel like frivolous, but if all of a sudden you're hit with a crisis that's an order of magnitude bigger, you don't think twice about spending that. It becomes very economic. So that's a, a realization that's happening in the island. The other one is that, and this is, I think, something that goes beyond liberal, conservative, uh, and in Puerto Rico, the discussion also goes through political status. That's a whole other story, which is that energy costs in Puerto Rico are way too high. And not only are they high, like I was saying before, right, they're like double at least the average in the U.S. It, the effective 
burden is much higher because average incomes are much smaller. So you have higher costs on much slower income, so it's like a multiple sized burden. So a lot of people, a lot of economists have been saying for years, energy is the lifeblood of the economy. If you get energy costs substantially down, it would really make a huge difference in small, medium-sized businesses, households, the spending they can have or not. So that's a pretty much a consensus, I think. So how do you get there is the issue. But I think the great opportunity here now is this rapid paradigm change that people are accepting, people on the streets. You, you see it in the newspaper, when, you know, if you read the comments that people write in, aside from the highly charged, cynical comments and political, a lot of people are just basically saying, of course, this is what you have to do. It's like, no brainer. Here's the chance that if there's a transition, one of the few ways to lower that is to phase out these costly, you know, billions of dollars a year that are spent importing fossil fuels, right? That's money drained out of the economy. Never mind the issue of whether it's feeding the same forces that are causing these phenomena, which is real. But if you start seeing the, the balance, the economic logic, you know, change where you start de- emphasizing, minimizing the fossil fuel imports, you start getting a handle on reducing energy costs and you start being able to then make the economy have a lasting sort of growth potential. One of the things that people who have studied these disasters, hurricane disasters and all that, is that when you really look at these types of of disasters, there's the damage that happens, but then there's the lasting multi-year damage that follows as well. And it's not about destruction, it's about just lost growth and lost, you know, just the drag so on, the negative on the possibility. Multiplier. Yeah, yeah. So being able to have a prospect of avoiding some of that horrible long-term drag, that alone is encourages, you know, investment and, and because people see, well, you know, if we get out of this mess and that energy costs are coming down, we can really get things going, especially in a place with high poverty rates because you start, that has direct impact right away on household consumption. You know, if you're not spending too much money on just having the lights on, you can actually then do other things. And so the economics of poverty and inequality in a country actually play into this catastrophic uh, situations because it has serious economic consequences. So this is a case where investing in reducing inequality and poverty actually has incredibly high returns for, at least for places like the Caribbean, where you can have these catastrophic situations recur. And, and, the, and I don't see anybody who says that, oh, this is a one-off thing, it will never happen again. So this is, this is very clear a proof of how investing in the social and economic justice side of the society actually has very high returns in the long run for being able to, A, avoid these disasters, the suffering and all that stuff, but also to be able to bounce back quicker Professionals in Puerto Rico are bouncing back. They will bounce back quicker. They lost income and opportunity, but they have savings. The people who don't have that, they're facing years, years, years of struggling and life-changing conditions. So if you had to put a crystal ball into making the post-hurricane impact more robust, what kind of suggestions would you leave with our listeners? I think that what this shows, I mean, initially it's, it's easy to focus on, oh my God, it's a terrible tragedy in the Caribbean and all that. But I think it's, this is a, it shines a light on a much bigger issue because Houston, much wealthier place, did not exactly have it easy either. So I think the, the, the thing is there are a lot of people in nonprofits, in government, in, in academia, that now for quite a long time have been thinking and researching all these things. I think what this can help is to bring it to, this is not just peripheral issues. These get at the heart of where is this whole climate phenomena going? Yes, it's, it's being highlighted in extreme fashion there, but this is not, you know, if you look at the reports about flooding and sea level rise around the coast in the United States, it's not just Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi, but the Mid-Atlantic, you know, New Virginia, England. New England, you know, it may take longer, whatever, but it, this is a chance to actually look at what's happened and what contributes to the lack of resilience 
and, and in Puerto Rico, it's an extreme example, right? You see everything collapse as you can actually see it in front of you. But it, the lessons here may be a little less dramatic, but you can start thinking, oh, my God, you know, preparedness. What, what does it mean to really be prepared? And how quickly do you have to be prepared? That's an angle that is new, I think, for many people. And what happened in Puerto Rico is that within a day or two, a storm going from tropical strength and Category 1 to all of a sudden Category 5, that brings its own requirements of, my God, you have to have, you, you have to be prepared. Number one, you have to have plans. You also have to be prepared to respond very quickly, not just respond, but respond very quickly. Have an, a population that's informed, you know, that you can reach the most vulnerable very quickly, you know. So there are lots of lessons that I think are applicable for everyone. And for the groups that are doing these things, I think bringing it closer to the center of what they're doing, I think has, you know, tremendous payoff. So last summer, we learned from another podcast guest, Hannah Payne, also an MIT alum, who's the sustainability coordinator for the city of Somerville, where you live, mm -hmm. uh, that you're on the commission for energy use and climate change. That's right. Any lessons learned from the Puerto Rico example that you're bringing back to Somerville? Well, first, I'm very glad to be a part of that commission because we're very fortunate in the city of Somerville that we have a, a great team, Hannah and Oliver Sellers Garcia, the director there and the people they work with, and then the support of the mayor and of the city government. So it, it, there's a lot of exciting things being discussed and working there. But I brought there pretty much the same message that, yes, we may not be worried about this kind of dramatic destruction or anything remotely like that, but there are lessons to be learned in terms of who's most vulnerable, why. What kind of readiness, you know, are there special implications? You know, this area, Cambridge, Boston, Somerville, has been pretty fortunate. You know, there's a wealth of consulting expertise and academics and all that. So the three cities, you know, that have been doing tremendous amount of planning and vulnerability assessments and climate change action plans and, you know, that's all in motion. So I would say they would be, they would be more quickly able to absorb the lessons. And I think it's, it's up to everyone to really absorb them, but not just for the city itself, but it's also to be able to, to show how it can be done for other places that don't have the resources, the academic and other resources. You know, if you, you, you lead by example and then share your experiences with others. And I think finding a way without it being exploitive, but just to learn from when something much more dramatic happens, you, it's good to pay attention and say, gee, you know, how much of that shines a light on what we could benefit from by avoiding the worst things or by picking up the best lessons from what's done to get out of it. Yeah. With that thought, I think, thank you so much, Ramon, for coming here and talking to us. Thank you. And do keep us informed about how things play out in Puerto Rico. I'd be glad to. Great to have had you here, Ramon. Thank you, Dave. Thanks. So if you have any thoughts, please share them with us at climatex at mit.edu or, of course, on Twitter or Facebook. You can also leave a comment right underneath this podcast. We look forward to hearing from you real soon. Thank you for listening. Bye.